Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for coming out tonight. I know that you've been uh, braving the snow and the ice for several days, and we certainly appreciate it. Um, before I get started, let me ask everyone to silence their cell phones. It's just polite. And it's embarrassing when yours rings and you forget. Ask my students. So um, tonight, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the ASCC for their generous funding of the Clark Art Talks and to thank everyone uh, involved in the selection of the Visiting Artist Series here at Clark. It's a, it's a great thing, and I'm glad that you guys are all here to partake in it with us tonight. Um, our next lecture will be actually a panel discussion. This is kind of a new thing for us at Clark um, with the artist Amjad Faor, uh, his exhibition Liban. Is that right? At uh, the Archer Gallery, will be opening next week, and um, it's a large-scale photographic installation. If you guys like photographs, um, it's not to be missed. His work is beautiful. We'll be having a panel discussion um, on uh, art history and politics in the Middle East Wednesday, March fifth, um, same time, seven p.m. in this room. So please uh, plan on attending. Um, as for tonight. It's uh, really my pleasure to introduce Kimberly Trowbridge, who is one of my painting heroes. Um, Kimberly, really, her, the way that she handles space and color and sensitivity to uh, subject, both figurative and landscape um, and abstraction, is a real inspiration for me. And um, I'm thrilled to have her come talk to you guys tonight. Uh, she received her MFA in painting from the University of Washington in 2006. She's had numerous exhibitions that just go on and on, including solo, solo exhibitions at Blindfold Gallery in Seattle, where she's represented, the Painting Center in New York City, Gage Academy of Art, where she's been a teacher many times, um, and she has upcoming, upcoming shows at the BAM, the Bellevue Art Museum Biennial in 2014. Um, what is that, in just a few months? October of 2014, and um, also in 2015 at Gallery for Culture in Seattle. Um, yeah, please welcome Kimberly Trowbridge. Thank you, Grant, and thank you so much to the Art Talks for having me out. It's wonderful to be here. I did my undergraduate work in English literature, and you're going to see how that really weaves into the narrative I'm going to tell you tonight. Language is really important to me. Um, I really wanted to be a poet as I was growing up. But I always made drawings and did paintings and made sculptures on my own. And it wasn't really till the last semester of my senior year graduating with my English Lit degree that I took a painting class. And that shifted my life completely because I found that I speak visually, that that's a really natural language for me. And so I'm going to dive right into my narrative there. So after doing this BA in English Literature, I went on to do a BFA in painting. So I stayed on at, the, at Indiana University for two more years and just got to focus on painting. And like many young artists, I really spent a lot of time doing self-portraiture. And this is really how I taught myself how to paint. And it was also a way of spending time with myself, observing myself. Um, a lot of my images early on were very much about exploring my own identity. And so here's a series of portraits that I did when I was a BFA, um, so my undergraduate thesis work here. And you'll see that the symbols of the letters come in and this idea of writing a letter. This image here is called Letter to You. And so, of course, I'm looking at myself in the mirror. And so it was a letter to myself, reaching out to myself as a future person. And this one's called Departure. And so, again, the symbol of the open book, the idea of the page or the written text is really important to me. This is a big influence of mine at the time. This is a Holbein painting. I love the plane in the foreground. I love all of the little letters and the handwriting on those letters. And also this palette, this kind of Northern Renaissance palette that's also in this Van Eyck painting that I was really thinking about at this time, this wedding portrait. So these rich, rich Northern Renaissance colors. And also the idea of these multiple figures in a space which really influenced me um, from the Italian Renaissance in particular. So I spent some time in Florence and got to see a lot of these big kind of epic multiple figure paintings, um, in particular the story of the Annunciation, which interested me a lot. Um, I didn't grow up in a religious family at all, and so I didn't even really know the stories 
of the Bible, but this was a really fascinating one to me, the idea of the incarnation um, of meaning from nothing. And this became a metaphor for me for the, act, for the creative act, for incarnating, incarnating meaning through the physical object of a painting. And so during the same time, I did this double self-portrait, and these figures are about life size, so it's a rather large painting. And it's me passing myself a letter, and the figure in the red became a symbol of the cardinal, which is the bird that's the messenger. And so my paintings, you'll see, begin, um, my narrative really begins here, because painting was a way for me, again, to observe myself, to observe my surroundings, but also to create stories that were meaningful to me, to be able to explore my own identity and interact with my surroundings, um, and also to record what was happening with me, um, even just on a minute level, the figure in the red with the long golden locks. I had actually chopped those off at the time, and so the figure on the left there is me with no hair, right? I had cut all my hair off, but in order to work on the figure on the right-hand side, I would clip those ponytails onto me, and so I was flipping back and forth. And so this is something also that's weaving into my current work, as you'll see a little later on, this idea of the performance of painting, or the idea of painting as a way to explore one's persona. And this is the very final painting I did in Indiana before I left um, and moved to New York for a year. And this is an important piece to me because this is where I really started to combine my strict observational work, so working from what I was looking at, and started inventing along with it. So the interior space and the landscape outside of the window are from observation, but the figures were completely invented. And this was something that was really important for me as an artist to feel free to be able to do. Because something that I love about painting is that it can both express an inner and an outer reality, that it shows us images that don't already necessarily exist in the world that we experience on a daily level. So I moved to New York for a year. I don't have any images from that time, but I was working on a lot of multiple figure drawings, really influenced by El Greco. And then I moved back to Seattle, where I'm originally from. I grew up in Everett, actually. And went to graduate school at the University of Washington. And this two-year period for me was really crucial because this is where I really started to break down my visual vocabulary into really simple components so that I could start to write the kind of visual poem or story or narrative that was important to me. And so this is really me learning my ABCs. And in such a way, it's so formal, they're just color and shape, but it also was very, very personal to me. In some ways, I was testing myself to see how little could I put down and for it to still very much speak to me in a personal, poetic way. And so I really limited my palette quite a bit. I'm using a lot of just pink and blue. Pink to represent the self for me, and blue to represent uh, the Puget Sound that I was returning to, or in a more universal way, sea, sky, atmosphere, space. And so I started to put these shapes together and started to let these almost kind of figurative elements start to announce themselves a little bit, a little bit more. And so I was really working very abstractly, but in truth, all along, the figure is there for me. The figure, to me, has often been the reason for the painting. It's a way of exploring the space through, uh, through body parts, really, especially at this time. So I was doing a lot of drawings. How can I break up the space of the page or the canvas in a meaningful way? A lot of sexual imagery comes in at this time as well, the kind of thrust of a shape, um, a kind of poetry of not knowing whose limbs are whose. And this is a collage from this time as well. And so really trying to see, OK, I've got these abstract, kind of formal, flat-colored shapes. I'm using tape there. But then what if I just, I was tracing images from some Japanese prints. What if I just outright say what my content is? How does that interact with the shapes that I'm putting down? And collage also, this is a rather large collage. I think it's about 70 inches wide. Collage has been a really, really important part of my practice, and it really started for me in graduate school. And 
I think the best way that I can articulate why collage has been so useful to me as a maker is because of the physicality of it. And I found more and more as an image maker that I need to feel that I'm building an image. It needs to feel physical to me. And I think part of that is growing up as a dancer. I need to feel that I'm choreographing with my body as much as I am with just my hand or my eyes or my mind. And so the freedom that collage allows is that if I don't want this here, then I can tear it or cut it off, and then I can move it over here. And that really revolutionized the way that I thought about image making um, in, pa in painting as well, that I could straight down the oil paint, move a shape to another direction. And so this is a very large painting. I think it's about eight feet wide. This was part of my master's thesis work, and this is called the Deluge. And so I was working with a lot of these, you know, kind of floating body parts. Again, very limited palette, the pink as flesh, the blue as sea and sky. Um, kind of a playful, bright palette, but at the same time, these images are really about potentially the ending of the world, that the deluge has happened. Um, painting that was really influential to me at this time and that has continued to be is this beautiful Pontormo deposition. Again, the kind of spiraling, and then also I think very evidently the palette, the pink and the blue, the Mannerist palette. But I love the way the space circles around because of the way that the character's limbs are focusing your eyes to move around the space. That's something I love about a lot of uh, Renaissance painting is it's the character's hands and limbs that are guiding the viewer where they want you to focus. And so also the Raft of Medusa was really influential to me too. So you'll notice some of those images I had just showed you. I'm really using these body parts, but building these kind of ships or rafts out of these body parts. So the combination of the figure and the sea. Uh, again, these elements of me kind of returning to my early narrative around the Puget Sound and facing uh, kind of the mythology of my youth. And so these images became really important to me. And then another big influence at this time, de Kooning. This is his big excavation painting that's in Chicago, huge painting. And so what I loved about this and his work in general is this incredible physical energy and the fact that he's filling this entire picture plane with body parts. And I think that that's a reason why um, again and again I return to the image of the lovers. And you'll see that that just keeps recycling through my work. And I think it's purely a big part of it is I want to fill the picture plane with body parts. That's what I'm interested in so much of the time. And it's the interaction of the lovers and again not knowing whose limbs are whose that is such a wonderful mm -hmm. subject matter for me to be able to get away with that. And so this was a thesis painting also from my master's work at UW. Um, this is called Hermaphrodite Brig One. So again, using that kind of light, bright palette, but having a rather uh, dark content to it. After graduate school, I lucked out and got to sublet one of my professors' large studios and got to continue really working on this body of work. I was continuing to do a lot of drawing. That eyeball there is actually a collage element, uh, thinking about the strange eye that slows you down. Um, also thinking about how this, that eyeball was actually a really important element for me because all these figurative elements that I've been showing so far could loosely still be described as abstract, but I was really challenging myself. Like, what, what if you put an eyeball in there? Like, what if you really say, hey, these are people interacting. And so I started to test myself a little bit with that. This painting here is called Big Hand. And this is one of the kind of, I consider major paintings after um, kind of going through translating in some ways getting over the whole experience of graduate school, but kind of a climax for me of being out of school. Uh, this is a painting that lives um, on the wall that I face when I wake up every morning in my bedroom. And so it's continued to be, it's continued to really grow on me. I don't usually show it in lectures, but I threw it in for this one just because it really, in my mind, is the thing that represents this time after graduate school for me. And this is a large painting. I think it's about 10 feet tall, also from this period directly after graduate school. Um, and this is called the big tickler and the end of the world. 
And <laughs> this painting no longer exists anymore. Um, I ended up painting over it and destroying it. And I, it's one of those paintings that really still exists for me as an important epic moment. And I definitely regret that it doesn't exist in the world anymore. And yet at the same time, my practice is so process-based that it does still exist for me. Um, in some ways, like I tell my students that a lot too, that sometimes when something comes up in a painting, that sometimes you have to sacrifice it to see what is going to happen after that. And if it's important enough, it'll reappear. I've had an experience where figures from past paintings, like ghosts, will come into a painting like five years later and be like, I know you. I remember you. And so in some ways, it's this kind of freedom or release to believe that the images that are powerful for you will return if they need to, if they're an important part of your story. So this is another large painting from that time. It's about nine or 10 feet across. And this is called Maritime. So you can see I'm starting to bring in kind of the heads and the eyeballs here, but still really rather abstract. And then I started to hit the idea of the portrait, and again, the eyeball again. This is a smaller portrait. It's strange to see it this large. This is called inner ear. Inner ear. So the sound of your innermost self. And so continuing on this track of thinking about portraiture, but also kind of cycling back around to those beginning roots as a painter and thinking about self-portraiture. Um, I've noticed over time that I have these cycles as a maker where I'm dealing with these kind of epic themes or the lovers, and then I'll cycle back around and really spend time with the self and the idea of identity. So this is a smaller portrait that I did where I started to use my profile um, as a flat cutout, and I was using a bright spotlight and holding up a mirror. And so I was casting a really sharp shadow of my profile on the wall. And looking through the mirror, I could see the wall and I would trace it out and I would then cut that shape out and use these stencils. And so for me, that was a way of really specifically placing myself into the painting but at the same time keeping it as a completely abstract flat shape. And so looking through the painting is another figure, and really even the whole palette of this was based off of my kindergarten portrait. And so again, really, and so that image, the portrait is called um, Self-Portrait as Us. So it's a portrait like a collaboration between me and little Kimmy T. Because I love her. <laughs> And so this is a large painting as well. Again, I love working large because it involves the choreography of the body. I think this is about eight feet wide. This is called mira mira, the Spanish verb, to look, to look. And I think of this, you know, of course I was thinking of Velazquez and the Principesa, you know, the big, uh, huge skirts that almost look like tabletops of the princesses, and then a little court attendant holding up a plane, you know, the picture plane, the canvas, or the mirror, and then the main character um, kind of hazily in the back with the outstretched arms selecting from a face to put on for the day. And so again, returning to the idea of persona and choosing an identity. And this is a Giotto painting. He's considered the grandfather of the Renaissance, and I really love his work. And in particular, I love these open facade structures that he used in his frescoes, which many early Renaissance artists did. And again, another return in narrative, this is the Annunciation. So Gabriel coming in and telling Mary that she's going to give birth to the Son of God. And so this amazing moment of that incarnation in this beautiful storybook open facade house. And I had just moved into my current studio, and so I had this beautiful new space that really felt like my own temple to create in. It was a two-car garage that I insulated and converted into this space, and so it was really the first time that I've had my very own space to do whatever I want with it. And so this is called the studio, and in parentheses, the Annunciation. And so you can kind of see the hand of Gabriel coming in through the window and the self 
uh, being reflected in the mirror, but also a reference to the process of its making with the stencil on the floor. So, and also the chair of the studio. And so this environment for uh, the event of the creative act to happen. And simultaneously with this painting, so I often work on multiple paintings at a time, this is a painting called Point and Shoot. And so it's another double self portrait. You can see the letters on the floor. And I was thinking of this space as the inside of a camera obscura, okay? So like that in, inner dark space where an image is being born. And so before we actually present ourselves to the world, what is that interactivity that's happening before that presentation or that image is born? Um, and the light bulb up on the top is based off of the light bulb that Picasso has in his Guernica painting, which acts like an eyeball. And so I was really thinking about that this idea of exposure, exposing a kind of horrific act, in this case, the exposure of the self to the self. And so I consider these big multiple figure paintings as my epic works, okay? Coming out of the Italian Renaissance, you know, always thinking capital P painting, I want these multiple figure epic paintings. But I always also work on smaller paintings that are dealing with my content in a more abstract manner. And often they'll hit on something that the larger works won't, that the larger works might start to illustrate an idea, um, almost that can fall flat at times, but the smaller ones um, often can hit at something that endures over time a little more. And this one in particular, I still really, really love this painting, and it's called The House We Carry With Us. And to me, it's the same you know, structure as the temple of the studio, the Giotto open facade. And I, I think of that wedge kind of in the center as, again, the Puget Sound that's so much a part of my youth in looking at it. And these other elements as the, the house of the body, you know, the, the language that we carry around with us throughout the day, the house that we carry with us. And another smaller painting from the same series, and this is called Letter in the Dark. And then I began this large painting. Basically, I built and stretched the canvas to be as large as it possibly could be on the studio wall. And this is the beginning of a big painting called Arcadia. And it started as this interior kind of bedroom boudoir scene. And so this is an in-progress shot early on from it. And one of the tech, just uh, formal problems I began to have with it was that I wanted to travel back through that space a little bit more. And the fact that I had set myself up with this idea of an interior space was really compromising what I could do with the painting. And so I started to neutralize and reduce the relationships um, in that background space, and this grass started to grow, and these greens started to appear, and so I realized that this bed was actually in a landscape. And so the way that I talk about that, that the grass began to grow, that really is how it feels to me as a painter. I'm so much a process painter. I don't figure out what I'm going to paint before I start. Painting, to me, the whole point of it is to make a mark, respond to that mark, and have a story start to unravel have a story tell itself to me. I don't really want to know what's going to happen. That wouldn't be that interesting to me as a painter. So this is the final piece called Arcadia. And these are images I was looking at at the time. I love Poussin. I love these lyrical, bucolic nymph and satyrs that have been in art history throughout time. Um, almost. So many painters throughout time have loved the figure in the landscape, and I really love these scenes. Um, and Cezanne, one of my very favorites, I love the movement um, in his brushwork. I love his bathers, they're my favorite of his paintings. And in this one in particular, this really dynamic interplay between the figures themselves and the environment or the atmosphere that the figures seem almost built out of the landscape. And then in, going along in the same tradition, but later we have Matisse's bathers. 
This was painted in 1917, and so this has the war inside of it. And so these bucolic pastoral scenes and then this darkness coming in and creating this darker content, this separation, this uh, fracturing of the connection between these figures. And this is a painting that really, really moves me. In some ways, it says everything that I've tried to say. And so after Arcadia, I stretched another canvas exactly the same size and hung it in the corner of my studio. And I usually start a painting by thinking about the entire space, but in this case, I started it in a very different way. You can even see here, I have a curtain hanging over half of the canvas. I was thinking of it almost like a scroll. And so I started just on half of it and then kept working my way over. And the way my initial idea for starting this painting was that I wanted to go behind the curtain in Arcadia where there was a certain darkness. And so I was conceiving of this space as kind of the shadow backside of that curtain. And so started to enter this darker forest-like space. And again, this was my new studio. My partner, Michael, and I had you know, just got our home and started to plant our very first garden. And so this plot of our garden in the yard started to enter into my dreams. Um, and I started to see it as this really beautiful place of growth, but also it had a strange, almost obelesque kind of grave-like shape or feel to it. And that began to enter into this larger painting. You can see here these legs in this larger shape here. And then as this painting continued to develop, this large vertical structure of the tree was breaking the space up a bit. And then eventually that vertical uh, became problematic to me in that I felt that this was too much a separate painting from this and I wanted to be able to see around or through that tree. And one of the beautiful things about painting is that it can be both. And so I decided to have a kind of x-ray vision through that without sacrificing that vertical structure that was a really important part of my overall design. And so this is called grave diggers. These Arcadian grave diggers are both 14 feet wide. Grave diggers. And you'll notice these lovers, this little cluster over here. So I decided after this, I, it was time to return to my lovers, that little cluster of figural activity. And I started to do a lot of drawings. Um, I wish I was the kind of artist that could really do a lot of drawing and painting simultaneously, but I've noticed in my own habits that they, I really go through periods of each, like drawings um, need my full attention, but often when I'm in the studio and I smell the oil paint, it's really hard for me not to listen to that and use the paint. I just love it so much. But I'm always pleased when I do give myself the time to draw because that's really the root of where uh, the vocabulary shifts happen, where really integral changes can happen. And so this is a series of drawings I was doing at the time. And these are all called lovers. And then I did a series of paintings loosely based off of some of these. Some of the drawings were actually drawn from the paintings. And so there's a kind of back and forth relationship that happens. So this, that, past, that former slide was Lovers in the Bower 1. This is Lovers in the Bower 2. And this is Lovers in the Bower 3. And the three of these were shown at this wonderful little pop-up gallery called Gallery 40 because it's four feet by 10 feet, so 40 square feet that wonderful artist in Seattle, very community-based, Todd Janusz, uh, set up. And it was on wheels, and so he would roll this little gallery around at different spots around the city. And this is actually one of my favorite exhibitions I've ever had. And we hung these leaves from this grapevine. Um, it was a really fun way to have a show. Um, it was interesting how you get a very different audience, too, out on the sidewalk. And I'm showing a couple progress shots here of a painting to give you the idea of how I often will start a painting. It's very, the excitement of painting to me often is in this initial stage where I'm just dividing the space of the canvas up. 
Again, that choreography of the body. What's the structure or the movement? And then I start to respond to that and build on that. In this case, with black in a very graphic way. And this is the final piece. This is called plant life. I was thinking of it um, in retrospect as these kind of almost classical figures as hosts to the viewer, witnessing the lovers either deconstructing or constructing the new human form. And this became one in a series of four paintings. All of these are 60 by 68 inches. And this is called Jupiter. And this is called the transformation. And this is just called Bauer. And after this painting, which was very geeky color theory based, I was just using three colors here. I was using black, cadmium yellow, and purple lake. So all of my greens are made out of black and yellow. And all of my neutrals, in order to get these figures to recede, are based off the complement set of yellow violet. And so it was a very intellectual, analytical painting. And it kind of burned me out. And I had a little bit of a, a stopping point in my practice where I was just feeling kind of exhausted. I felt that I, I didn't want to be in the studio. It became too analytical. I also felt that I wanted to leave Europe. I was dealing with all these bucolic scenes um, and looking at all these European painters. And, I wanted to leave Europe and see what was happening here at home. And during this time of this kind of breakdown, my mom had sent me a folder of drawings that I had done when I was three and four. And I was so struck by these. Just So these lines are in graphite. And I was just so struck by the energy and the freedom with color application. And it really like kind of lit a fire for me. Just come on, Kim, what are you doing? Like what does painting mean to you? And also the totemic structure of it was really interesting to me. And so I started these portraits, these are just the intro of them, based loosely off of these childhood drawings. And they be and the smallness of them also was important to me, and kind of the intimacy of feeling the paint. And this became a series of four portraits. Um, and this is called Chief. And this one's called Warrior Princess. And this one's called The Eagle Behind the Feather. And this one's called The Intuit. And so it became very clear to me that a new narrative was arriving, that these were kind of the characters, the portrait studies, of these new figures that were going to enter into my bigger epic works to tell me a story that I hadn't already heard. And so at the same time that these portraits were developing, these, the series of other paintings happened. I have headdress on the left, black mirror in the center, and shield on the right-hand side. And so these felt like the nouns or the tools that these figures were going to need in order to face this narrative that was coming up. And so I'm sharing this with you because this is really very intimately how I work. I write stories. I'm a narrative painter, I think, truly, truly at root, at heart. And so using imagery in this way and thinking of them as nouns versus the verb of the larger painting is one of the reasons that Philip Guston is one of my heroes. So he was early on part of the abstract expressionist movement and then really went off on his own into these other figurative works. But whenever I've seen this studio shot of his, I've always felt like, you know, it was just these nouns that he was lining up, this language of objects and things that he could then combine and use in his larger narrative paintings, this one being studio. And so he has been a real heroic figure to me in my practice. And so if those portraits were the characters and the shield and the black mirror were the tools, then this was the context or the environment. And this is called dystopia. And how I was thinking about this image was that this was the last patch of grass left on Earth. 
And so then these larger paintings started to develop. And this is called Growing Things in the Dark. Again, creating something out of nothing. And this used to be a fire pit, which then the reds and oranges turned into greens and became foliage. But in terms of the space that I was thinking about, I was thinking of it as this interior of a teepee or a hut, and that these were the flaps of the door and the light coming in. And another painting from this time, this is called The Gift Horse. People see a lot of different things in here, but what I see is a horse arcing over leg, neck, head, and then a skull little fire pit or the gift, a figure outstretched on her back, on the back of the horse with a feathered headdress. And this is called I Am Nature. And so another large painting that I started to develop after these, this is an in-progress shot to give you a sense of how I was building this, I really wanted the scale of my shapes to continue to get smaller so that I could tell even more epic tales. So instead of a canvas holding only the two lovers or one or two figures, I wanted to make a painting that had 40 figures in it, you know, like a really great battle scene. And so I was forcing myself to make these smaller fragmented shapes to try to do this. And I was really looking at one of my great heroes, Piero della Francesca, another Italian Renaissance artist. I just love the interplay and abstraction of his shapes of light and dark and color, a beautiful mosaic of shapes. And here's a detail of this large battle scene painting of his that I was literally culling shapes from and using on my painting to encourage that behavior. And so this is the final painting. It's this kind of cauldron and this war scene, this battle scene kind of moving through the smoke and then the figure, the Pythia, the uh, keeper of the temple. And so it was, it, the title of the painting is called Smoke Signals. And so it's this battle scene kind of wandering through the smoke as a vision. And so all of these larger paintings I've been showing you are invented. They're what I call studio paintings. I'm not working from observation, but I want to really, really emphasize that I get my information from observation, so much of it, and I call that raw data. I am constantly working from observation, in particular in the studio. I teach, I have a small school that I run out of my studio, and so I'm working from the figure at least minimum 12 hours a week, and so this kind of fractured language that I use. This is a figure sitting in the space from observation, and so I'm constantly practicing this. I all, as creative as I feel at times, I am also really like to honor my really fierce intellectual analytical mind. I value that about myself, and I love looking at observation. This is a collage from a figure, and really analyzing the separate parts of space and structure. And so this is another example. This is an example of a setup I might make in my studio to work on with my students and to actually place a figure in this to be able to create my nudes in the bower. So an interior theatrical space of the landscape. And so these are some studies that I've done in the studio with my students um, from the figure and then also collaging from the figure. And this one as well, I set up a warm light on the floor and invented, actually you'll see from one of my sculptures, that fire pit is a sculpture that I made to emulate the fire pit there. And the model I just have move around into different positions. And so this is, I learn a lot about structure from observation, but it's also really how I get my chops and sensitivity and understanding about color theory. And so, it, for instance, this whole period with my work, I was working with a secondary palette of orange, green, and violet, and working so much with that palette from observation allowed me to start inventing images like this, the bathers, with that same palette where each color 
had a very specific symbolic meaning for me, like that the, this particular violet that happens always seems to happen underneath the arm, or that this kind of orangish, mossy green seems to be a lot the light that reflects under the thigh, for instance. And so the colors had really specific meaning for me. And these works started to develop into these figures kind of morphing into trees. This is called branches. And then I started to work with actual wood and started to build these sculptural installations that in some ways felt like to me if my paintings were painted from observation, my larger ones that were invented, that these might be the setups that I was looking at. And so it was trying to make physical what my paintings were actually doing as a two-dimensional image. And so this complete sculpture here, this is called Effigy. And so that's actually the little fire pit that I was using in that other painting with the figure in the studio. And I'm by no means a carpenter. These are built in the same way I build a painting. I just start nailing and gluing stuff together and seeing what happens. It has to be really messy and direct for me for it to be interesting. And this is a relief here. So just wood glued and nailed together and then painted on top of. And I loved the challenge of this to try to create shapes or forms, um, but have the physical components fight against that. Because I think in some ways, as a painter, I'm always trying to make things more difficult. Because I don't want to make a pretty image of a figure. That's not that interesting to me. Like, skill isn't that interesting to me after a certain point. What I want is something that, where my skill moves up against it and something else blossoms, where I'm fighting with the material a little bit or with the content a little bit because that's, I think, where growth happens. And this is a painting called Heirloom based off of an Afghan my mom stitched when I was a kid. And so I move into this kind of current period that I'm in. I started doing these plein air landscapes to get ready. I, I was taking my students to Spain with me and I've done this for the last two years now been doing these international tours with them. Um, and so I was painting these in the backyard just to get ready for being out in the landscape with my students and really fell in love with this process. And then also still working from the figure in the studio, but then translating that work from observation into more abstract color structures. And I started to build this body, this larger painting and body of work based off of all of these studies, both landscape and the figures in the studio. And you'll see that I really, I'm not interested in blending color. I'm really interested in how colors in themselves can create structures. And so this is the top of that painting. And then here it is as a finished painting on the wall with all of its studies. So this was a body of work that I was building for a show, for an exhibition that I had this past September. But I completely abandoned all of this work. None of it has ever been shown because something inside of me, it's a little difficult to talk about, but something inside of me really rejected everything about this body of work, that it was not appropriate for what was happening to me internally. And so I set all of this work aside, and mind you, clock was ticking. I had this exhibition coming up, so I was under a lot of pressure and dealing with um, some pretty intense inner turmoil. But I started this second painting that looked like this in the very beginning, this kind of agitated cluster. And it started to appear that it was a, a kind of medieval battle scene. So we've got our little soldiers, we've got figures at war, we even have horses or dogs or llamas, I don't know what they are. But I was going through a certain anxiety, but at the same time I was like, yay, I want these smaller structures, right? I talked about that I want to do the epic battle scene, I want there to be 40 or 200 figures on my picture plane. And so I was glad that that was happening and I started to build this large structure around it. 
But then these smaller shapes of the horsemen and the soldiers started to consolidate. You can see this larger figure starting to appear, and you'll see how this larger figure and a horse starts to appear. And I was really upset that these figures were appearing. But in terms of narrative and looking back on it, this was happening on the other side of the studio. So this is the horse woman, the woman on the horse appearing, who then appears in the piece. But in looking back at this body of work, it became clear to me that I had in some way set up this medieval battle scene or this arena. And because it was painted with such small shapes, I was viewing it from really far away. But then it was kind of like the joke was on me. Because guess who had to go in there and fight? Guess who had to go in there and face the self? And so these larger figures appear, and it really was a very, very intense inner struggle for me. And this is a very difficult mm -hmm. painting for me to make. And this is the complete piece installed in my show that was called Story Tell Her at Blindfold Gallery. And the altarpiece structure that I built around it, and then these painted panels, in some ways was a way for me to be able to live with this image. I needed to contextualize it. I couldn't live with this image that close to me, but by placing it within this kind of historical context, and even portraying it in such a way that these pages from a newspaper or from books of an art history book, um, as if it's telling the story of this, allowed me separation to move away from that inner turmoil that had happened so I could begin to construct a new narrative for myself and to move on. So this is a close-up of those panels, and one of them singularly, and you'll notice that the words really don't exist. They're just small ticks. I would have sentences in my head or the lyrics of the songs I was listening to, and I would tick out the numbers of the letters for the words that were happening. And so thinking of language in a very abstract way as a visual object. And I'm going to move through these installation shots. This is a really important show for me because I took over the entire space and really treated it as an installation. And that's really where my work is moving right now, is thinking about how, not just how to make the painting work, but how to situate the painting in the world, or how to present the painting to my viewers in a very specific way. This installation is called Language, and so it's about building the pieces for my visual language. And this is across the room from that. So I called this whole second room of the installation the coping room. This was me like getting over that tantrum that had happened and starting to build a new language. This is a detail of one of the sculptures called Slain, Warrior and Slain. And this detail is of Slain. And this is Woman, Woman, Woman thinking of the canvas as a page and these repeated structures, almost like hieroglyphics. And this is called tree print. The top panel is done in oil and then all the markings are done in ink and it's on muslin, a very fine material. Four days after my opening of this show, I flew to Spain to do my plein air painting tour with my students and after that 10 days, I spent a month on my own um, at a residency uh, at the foothills of the Montserrat Mountains, about 40 minutes north of Barcelona. And this was a really, really fantastic time for me. Um, I spent time in the mountains every day, um, would set up a little studio for myself in a different part of the mountain each day, and just painted the landscape. And there was something so refreshing about responding to my environment. <laughs> to just have the freedom to be released from my own freaking content <laughs> in my studio and to be able to really respond to this incredible world that we have in front of us was a real release for me and incredibly healing. So these are some of the plein air paintings of that time. And in the evenings, I would take these studies into the studio. I started making collages. You can kind of see how this harkens back from my early work, my graduate work, the figure starts to appear, so it becomes kind of how the self now is responding, or how the, 
how the landscape is inside of the figure now, how the landscape is rearticulating or creating a new me. And this I think of almost as a haiku poem. It's called Figurative Landscape. And then these are also paintings I did by sort of stitching together the plein air studies I did throughout the day. So these are nighttime paintings. This is called Montserrat, the name of the mountain. And this is my current studio. So when I got back, you know, I hung up all of my works from Catalonia. I had a studio exhibition. And my current body of work is really responding to trying to bring this new self home with me, to using these images that happened for me in Catalonia and starting to kind of massage them into my daily life so that I don't forget the person, the self that I met over there. This is one of the first paintings I did uh, within a day or two of returning back to Seattle, and it just happened all in just one shot. It was a memory of the room and the environment. And the whole experience of doing the plein air and the landscape has really changed the way I'm currently thinking about my studio practice, that absolutely anything and everything can come into the work now. So I'm thinking of plein air painting in my studio. And it sounds kind of ridiculous because really I'm just painting from a photograph here on my laptop, but somehow using my little pochode box and setting it up and acting as though that were the landscape in front of me is giving me this very different conceptual approach to what's around me, that I'm doing a plein air painting from the laptop screen, and then starting to collage those images together in the way that images and different folders that we have open on our laptop screen um, start to overlap and create new images. So I'm really thinking a lot about the way we organize information. Um, and that very much came into this recent current uh, installation that was a collaboration between my friend Andrew Bartels and I. He's a poet. And our correspondence through mail and him sending photographs from when we had first met and became friends, and me starting to make images based off of the text messages we were sending back and forth, and creating this cluster, this visual cluster that is blending both text and image um, and this whole uh, installation is called Documents. And so it's documenting us observing our own relationship as friends. And so that main piece in the center is a plein air painting of all of those documents that were hanging on the wall of my studio. Me plen an image of me plein air painting that he had taken of me when he lived in Seattle and texted it to me on my phone. Another, this is a ink sharpie and colored pencil drawing from a text message. And this is a drawing from Spain. So I said that the current work is really a blending of what happened in Catalonia with what's happening in the studio. And so that collaboration that I did with Andrew has given me great freedom to think about the documents in my own environment in a different way. So this is a photograph of my boots and my plant from when I was in my early 20s. And it just happened to be lying around and taping it up to this and the way that those leaves start to interact with that. And so I feel this incredible freedom in my practice right now that everything can come in. And that's really important to me to feel free in that way because I need to be in a place with myself that anything and everything can enter my narrative. And I think that so much the process of being an artist is constantly trying to find a process and a language that allows you to include more and not less, to let everything in to articulate a story. A recent figure study. This is my current studio, what it looks like right now. These are all these crazy paintings that I don't, just come in and I respond to something and then I walk away from it. It's a really strange process that's happening. I'm not being analytical about it at all. I just start working on an area, responding to something in the space. And then my very last image is the other side of my studio, which is a really exciting thing that happened to me when I returned from Spain. 
Um, I started to teach myself piano, and I've never played an instrument in my entire life, and I'm starting to write songs. So when I'm painting in my studio, I hear sounds or I hear a phrase, and I try to find the sounds. And I'm really attracted to the visual patterning of the keyboard, and I'm so excited to incorporate this into my practice. Um, my heart feels so big and so full and so inspired. Um, and it's an incredible place to be, and I, I hope to carry it over with me. Uh, thank you so much for being here and listening to my narrative. It's a meaningful experience for me to tell it and to retell it and to change it each time. So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Yeah, the, yeah it, when, when that happens, it is kind of shocking, isn't it? I think a lot of that was um, responding to this big backyard and garden that I had just uh, come upon in my own practice in life because my studio was no longer in the city. It was really, you know, kind of suburbia. And so really responding to the environment outside. And I almost can't imagine being a Northwest painter and not having that happen at some point. The different greens uh, that happen in our daily life are incredibly inspiring. Um, and so also a big part of that too, how that follows through is doing the plein air paintings with my students and really starting not only to fall in love with the difference in those greens, but to have to articulate the difference in those greens so that I could share those discoveries with my students. That's been very meaningful. You know, they say, and I agree, green's kind of the hardest color. It doesn't get along with the other colors. <laughs> you can make really nice paintings and then green comes in and just ruins them. With the self. <laughs> I've also heard several gallerists say, I won't show a green painting they don't sell. <laughs> How ridiculous is that? Ridiculous. <laughs> Anyone else, question? If you're shy, I'd be happy to talk to you one on one too. Yeah. You're no longer at Katie. Katie Johnson. Hello, dear. I am there on Mondays teaching really foundational courses, color theory and design concepts. Um, but the pattern that has happened over the last couple of years is that I'm only there during the winter term because I've been doing my international tours in the fall. And then the spring, I usually just teach workshops out of my studio. So, and that's been a really fantastic schedule. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. I don't know if I did say the piece. Um, it's called Tantrum. The painting is called Tantrum, but the entire installation that it's part of. It's called Tantrum and the Aftermath. And so the aftermath, of course, refers to it being contextualized and having the kind of pages of its history on the side of it. Just want you to know, I really liked that one that you didn't want to display or show. Oh, the one I abandoned? Yeah, I really liked it. Thank you. You know, I, it's actually showing its face in the studio right now. I'm re-evaluating my own response to it. It actually really is pretty beautiful. Yeah, for some reason I, I couldn't live with it though at the time. I think that it's probably going to become part of a larger different body of work at some point. Like my kind of response to it as an after fact will become a whole new body of work, I imagine. But I don't have control over these things. The content finds me. <laughs> Yeah. In what you just said about the painting having its own agency, mm -hmm. was that always true from that first painting class that you took as an undergrad, or is that something that you came to realize slowly? Yeah, moment? definitely something that developed. Um, 
I think I always wanted it to be that way, and that's part of just that tension as a young artist, you know, that you're trying to put your ideas down, and the thing never looks like your ideas, and it's just a horrible, grueling thing of battle. And so for me, a big part of my process of developing is releasing that. But it's, I, it's not always just a given that it's released. I constantly have to remind and get into a space with myself where I'm releasing that, where I'm free with the image to let it speak to me. Like that every time I meet a blank canvas, that, that problem is there, you know? And so when I become conscious of me trying to control its subject matter or content, I, I stop working on it for a while because it, it's, that's a really dangerous area for me. I don't want to make an image that looks good or that feels right in terms of it's illustrating something I thought of. Like that's really dangerous, you know? Sometimes I don't know that for years after even, but I can point to paintings of mine and say, that's not real. That is not real. That is a lie. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.